Um, this is a series that we've had going on since November. So we're thankful to have everyone joining us um, in these best practice circles uh, for February. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, we will be utilizing chat, so please feel free to chat in any questions you have throughout the session today. Uh, let us know who's here. Uh, tell us where you're calling in from, where you're located, and what organization you're with, um, and also your role in managing your multi-visit patients or your super utilizers um, within your organization. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any input that um, you want to contribute, definitely utilize the chat. Um, with me today, um, we have Diane and Shannon. Um, they'll be checking out chat and keeping us informed as we go along. And real quick, my name is Stephanie Baker. I'm with Health Centric Advisors, part of the IPRO Quinn QIO. Um, and I am actually going to turn it right on over to Shannon from IPRO today. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Wolanin. I am a quality improvement specialist with IPRO. So I'll just give a quick overview for some context on the program we are going to hear about today. So the New York State Department of Health Medicaid Accelerated Exchange, or MAC series, was originally developed under the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. The 2022 MAC series was led by the New York State Department of Health and multi-visit patient method developer, Dr. Amy Boutwell. MAC's focuses on improving care for individuals whose underlying unmet needs result in high utilization of hospitals and emergency departments. Max engages and empowers frontline hospital teams of clinical and social service providers to make changes that are locally relevant and operationally feasible to address these root causes of high utilization. Um, Max provides a vehicle for frontline provider teams to improve care, reduce costs associated with avoidable admissions and benefit under VBP arrangements. MAX is structured as three rapid cycle continuous improvement workshops convened over an eight month period with weekly touch points for each action team in between workshops. MAX 2022 was held entirely virtually. Um, so there will be a link added in the chat for more information on MAX. It'll take you right to the DOH MAX website. So now I would like to introduce Jennifer Cord. Jennifer is Associate Director for Executive Administration at New York City Health and Hospitals, Queens. She is a licensed clinical social worker, a certified Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and she's the Administrative Champion of the MAX Action Team at Queens Hospital. The Queens team was one of our standout teams from the MAX, uh, the 2022 MAX series, and we are excited for them to share how their participation in the 2022 MAX series provided a framework for their team to do something different for these patients that need it. Jennifer has a lot of great information to share today with her team, so I will now turn it over to Jennifer for further introductions in today's presentation. Jennifer? All right. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a wonderful experience for our hospital to have the opportunity to improve care delivery and for all the participants. Um, we'll be sharing later that we have representation from every department within the hospital, inpatient, ED, ambulatory care, and it's just been um, a really um, provider and um, clinician-driven um, experience. I will be um, joined today by our, what we call our lead um, super um, clinician, Lana Bind, who is a social worker. She is the assistant director with care and case management, and we've named her our social service MVP subject matter expert. And then we're going to be joined by Nadira Ituru, who is our director of nursing for care and case management followed by Dr. Eben Kimball, our attending physician. So why, why Queens and what have we been doing? Um, we had participated in a first pass of, um, of the MAC series. And when, like with most people, I'm sure you can relate, when COVID came, we directed ourselves to patient care 
and the care delivery improvement modality and focus um, was not our primary aim. So what we've done is reconvened the team and we have um, been utilizing all the existing elements that we had from the first pass. We've optimized our IT tools. Um, we have um, a tracking system. So for example, how do we identify our MVPs, our multi-visit patients? We have our EPIC specialist that pulls um, their presence from a data, the EPIC um, portal. Um, by 7 o'clock in the morning, that person sends out to the entire team the list of MVPs so we know who's in the house and that's how we notify them. And we um, have um, uh, our lead um, subject matter expert. Um, we've decided for this path that we were going to keep it very simple and focus on two MVPs per day. We really didn't have the bandwidth to expand to all of the MVPs in the, in the hospital at one time. So we just decided to take a slow and deliberate review of all of our MVPs. And then what we've done is um, follow the pathway in terms of um, engaging these patients using a motivational interviewing approach, trans-theoretical model of change to really see where they're at in terms of identifying what they, are, um, what they want to work on as their driver of utilization. And we have developed a communication system, which is a plan for their return that's documented and held in EPIC in a place where everyone can find. We also have a weekly case conference meeting where we all collaborate to see what we can do to improve care delivery to these patients. And then we're gonna be talking about some success stories and just our struggles with providing care to this very complicated patient group. Um, what we learned during our first pass was that our MVPs represented 2.7 of all percent of all of our patients, and that they were four times more likely to be admitted. So this little group of patients had a tremendous impact to our uh, patient um, care delivery team and to utilizing resources. And it became even more imperative during COVID when we really had to optimize our beds and our use of resources that we try to stabilize these patients as much as possible in the community versus in the hospital. And as I've mentioned, we've been very fortunate to retain many of the initial um, next um, MVP team members and we've added, over the course of our participation, we've added our ED lead social worker. That's a new program that targets chemical dependency patients in the ED. We have um, really utilized our EPIC provider to tell us what efficiencies are available within EPIC. We've even partnered heavily with patient accounts because financial information and the medical coverage information is so vital. One of the things that we've struggled with is um, our analytics department um, has had some up and downs. So getting timely data is, is an ongoing issue. Um, when we first started Max, our um, data analytics person was so involved with us that he did his capstone on the MVP patients. So um, we are utilizing data based on um, our dashboard, which we'll discuss later. But this just represents that their um, length of stay for the MVPs, for example, is about 6.7, where a typical patient is, for our hospital, 5.2 days. You can advance the slide, please. This is our care delivery model, and it reflects uh, an approach that we have which we've done with this whole project, which is continuous improvement. When we did our first pass, one of the things that we found very important is that the team wanted to have a dedicated MVP um, group that would really know these patients and can be activated at any time to intervene with the existing providers. 
And we've been able to come close to this ideal state by having a dedicated resource that we've embedded in our care management department. And as I mentioned, we call her our social service subject matter expert. So her role is to utilize this list of patients that come um, to us in the morning. She goes out with the care manager, so they are interviewing the patient simultaneously, and they assess the patient for the driver of utilization. They record this information in the medical record, and then they can con they then consult in a in a huddle with our doctor, with a social worker, with all the team members that are important. And one of the things that has been really just instrumental in getting the results that we've gotten and, and formulating our approach is um, our subject matter expert has become the quarterback. She is the holder of all the information and corrects misinformation, ensures that all the providers get the key information that's needed. I'll give a key example. We had a patient who just was um, moving to so many different houses that the EPIC chart just couldn't keep up with her accurate address. So every time somebody tried to reach out to her in the community, the information was not correct. She's able to contact those um, community resources and make sure that everyone is given the correct information. So we've cut down on the loss of information, increased the accuracy of information, and she keeps everyone focused on the DOU, so what's really important and vital. And then she maintains contact with these patients until a community quarterback is hardwired and a handoff is made to that patient. And that's something that we, we felt was just essential to our program. And the other piece that um, is important is that we have embedded care managers and so when that patient shows up in our ED, they are flagged and our care manager reads the documentation, um, goes back to that ED care alert, and then um, goes to the ED care providers and they consult together with um, a plan of action. And this was um, a result of us partnering with our ED, um, our ED providers and they really ask for someone to do this in-depth analysis and then come and partner with them. The provider has the ability to read the note, but we really benefit from having a subject matter expert who the providers trust to help um, uh, divert the admission, or if the patient is indeed admitted, we don't lose time in terms of um, linking the patient with the elements we felt were essential from the next um, path. And then we have a weekly case conference that no matter how busy people are, even if they attend for 15 minutes, we have our ED providers uh, pr uh, attending, we have our pharmacists attending. Everyone gives some level of feedback to see how we could approach the case differently. So that's our MVP model at Queen. And this is, uh, again, tools that I've mentioned that we find essential to managing our MVPs. We have a, a registry where we put the um, demographic information, we put down the driver of utilization, and we then indicate what, who's involved with the patient, who the quarterback is, the community contacts, everything's on the spreadsheet so that we can track these patients over time. And when we see incorrect information, we can correct it very easily. We also utilize a weekly dashboard provided by our analytics department where we are able to see how many MVPs are in the house and how many MVPs we've been able to service. And we manage the, the unique list of MVPs over time. And we ensure that every time they come back that they're seen by our team. In advance, please. So at this point, I'm going to hand this over to our um, our care management team, Nadira and um, 
Lana, and they will be discussing the assessment phase. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Lana Vines, and I represent the other here at Queen's Hospital. And uh, I would like to talk about the assessment stage uh, when we basically, before we meet with the patient at the bedside, uh, we learned uh, that it's very, very important to gather all of the information about the big picture and you utilize all different resources uh, in order to basically play as a little investigator because we need to get as much information as we can about the patient, about patient's care, who is involved in the community, for the caregivers, for the providers. So we utilize, of course, electronic uh, medical records. We utilize uh, interdisciplinary rounds uh, and uh, also uh, different contacts that we make to the family caregivers providers. And uh, we target- so oh, sorry to interrupt, but we are getting it a little bit of, uh, it's hard to hear if you can maybe get closer to your computer and then we'll make sure everybody else is muted. How about now? Okay, so we target those uh, stakeholders who know the patient the best. And every time we are speaking with each of those stakeholders, the main question in the back of my mind was always, who is not involved? So we had to sort of fill in the gaps and find out you know, which was a critical consideration, who is not involved? Because knowing who is not involved would help us to develop the intervention plan of who we need to get involved in order to prevent readmission. Uh, so that's really the main part and collaboration with the stakeholders who reflect medical and social perspectives is the focus on the whole person. So not only medical needs, but the social determinants of health are very important criteria for the assessment. Um, so hi, I'm Nadira Eduardo. I'm the director for uh, care and case management. Um, and after Lana assesses these patients at bedside, um, what she does is she actually drills down to figure out what the driver of utilization for these patients are. And we found after doing this multiple times, there were really three that stood out um, amongst all the others. And that's inadequately addressed plant for recurring issues, inadequately addressed substance use disorders, and inadequately address services and supports. Um, for our recurrent um, issues, um, we actually found that we had a group of hemodialysis patients that kept coming back. And it turned out that the issue was just transportation. It was that they needed help to be linked to transportation in between areas to get them back and forth to their dialysis centers. Another um, work that we did, we found um, a goals of care discussion, like palliative care, was not really taking place. And we have an example later on where we really delve into that a little bit more. And then for our inadequately addressed substance use disorders, what we did is we really linked with our ED leads team um, to really connect with these patients. And it was great because this is a team that usually just works in our community, but through this program, they would go and meet patients that they didn't know they were needed. And it was really a beautiful thing. Um, and Lana, I'm again, so happy that she's part of care management. Um, because she really was able to link our patients to services um, that really needed it. So she really is that bridge. Next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, what are the uh, continuing partners that we involve uh, during the uh, intervention stage? Uh, and uh, so basically, I'm just going to go through the key ones that uh, play the major roles through all of our interventions. Uh, like Nadira mentioned, the lead team, those are our substance use specialists who uh, see patients and not only in the ED, but also based on our request in, at the bedside. They develop the intervention plan, they provide uh, patients with the referrals. Uh, concrete referrals, sometimes they even get the transportation to get to the patient so they can be 
uh, uh, sent to the inpatient rehab uh, substance use facility. Sometimes they go right from the ED uh, without getting admitted. So this is a really great resource for us. Another partner in the community that we uh, developed uh, with the ACT teams, patients that have serious mental illness with SMI who are being followed by in the community by the ACT team. Uh, those are very important partners uh, in the community that we work with and we basically develop them as a quarterbacks because they know the patient best. And uh, very much this exchange of information uh, uh, led us to understand that that would reduce the uh, uh, number of readmissions. Uh, another very important partner that we uh, found out was uh, we, we had the hemodialysis center, where we found out that the social workers and the nursing staff very important providers of information about the patient care in the community that would give us that outlook that open our eyes in terms of the drivers of utilization. Uh, very often that uh, that part that we see. Uh, in, another partner that we developed a lot of uh, relationships with is the health home from care coordination services. We uh, basically investigated and linked our MVPs to care managers and community support through care coordination. Uh, those care coordinators, house homes, are our eyes and ears in the community for the patient because they're the ones who are making uh, home visits. They meet patients where they are in the community and they give us back the information regarding the patient in the community. So those are very important and partners that uh, we feel play the key role in our care for the MVP. Next slide, please. So as Jennifer mentioned before, we then have to manage these patients over time, right? Um, so we have a few tools that help us to do that. So we um, keep track of all our multi-visit patients uh, through a registry. And then using our electronic medical record, you know, that's... Um, also able to really, um, everyone's on the same page, which is great. Um, and for me, what really helped to me, the key was having Lana in as a care management department. Because our care management department is really focused on uh, reducing readmissions, keeping patients healthy and safe in the community. And her being part of my team really enabled her to kind of see the full spectrum uh, for the patient from when they're here and even follow them up when they're in the community. Um, and it was great. And every single time the patient came back, we learned a lot more. And these patients really developed a bond with her and would call her. We were surprised when the patient called her back. And, you know, like some patients that we had difficulty with would call her back because she developed that before. And it was really, really great. Um, we were able to do so many community partnerships, uh, just, you know, the simple task of just reaching out to the dialysis centers for some of our patients who keep coming back, who are on dialysis was amazing because it gave us another view, vantage point of what's going on with the patient. So this is, you know, for me, her being embedded with my team was the biggest, you know, the best change that could happen. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm gonna hand it off to our attending physician, Dr. Kimball, to discuss the plan for return. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dr. Kimball. Um, I'm on the inpatient side. Um, I'm a hospitalist here at Queens Hospital Center. Um, we've been working together with the ED folks, our um, ED counterparts, trying to come up with a plan for the return. And our uh, idea um, or the way that we're trying to do this is figure out how we can do an ED care alert. Um, the goal is some sort of flagged note um, in a perfect world, it would be uh, a note that nobody, that any sort of ED provider, whether it be a new uh, mid-level provider or a, an attending, would be able to see without too much hassle and gives them a short, um, brief, but comprehensive understanding of who the patient is, especially when it comes to the medical side of things. 
um, because there is a whole nother, there will be a whole nother record um, that details the comprehensive psychosocial issues that um, Lana and Indira were talking about. But um, the goal for this note was to try to um, address any specific medical issues that could prevent or um, prevent a readmission, right? So here are a couple of um, kind of real world adjacent examples. You know, a patient who comes in for constant non-compliance with anti-epileptics, we noticed that a patient like that would get admitted for seizure with, you know, breakthrough seizure, quote unquote, but it's really the patient's not taking their seizure meds, right? So the, the whole point of this would be to, to, be to alert a provider, hey, this patient's just not taking their meds, they get admitted all the time, they just get restarted and they get sent home. So instead of just admitting them for the same thing, please consider talking to this, you know, their PCP or some quarterback or have at least a chance for that to be addressed early on as opposed to just blindly admitting them like it's been done so many times before. So the whole goal for this is to try to put the note in a place where it can be seen and it's accessed and not just ignored and it's short enough that a busy ED provider could do it. And, you know, it's kind of an ongoing collaboration between our ED providers and the inpatient service because what, as an inpatient phys physician, I might have a different focus than the ED provider, but kind of going back and forth and trying to figure out what's relevant, what's appropriate, what's accurate, and what's short enough to actually be usable is really kind of our, our goal. So here's just a couple of examples and trying to work with our existing electronic medical record to try to figure out where it would be best accessible, whether it pops up as a flag or whether it's part of a, of a dedicated note. Um, we're still continuously working with um, you know, it's, it's difficult to get Epic to build a whole new thing, especially because we are part of the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and we can't just make unilateral changes, but it's still a work in progress, and um, we're trying to figure out which works best for our workflow and preferably with the least amount of onboarding, but um, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, next slide, please. Um, Okay, so you know, in, this, in terms of our stories of successes, um, I think we've talked about them before. With um, you know, Dira and Lana have kind of talked about it. Um, you know, we've been able to um, work with our uh, dedicated social services MVP, Lana. Um, we have many team members involved. Um, essentially, it's all about interdepartmental and interdisciplinary collaborations. We can uh, meeting weekly to review these MVPs, talk about who they are as a whole person, not just medical, not just social, not just logistical, but you know everything that's involved with them and having everyone talk through it and bring their, their, um, their uh, aspect and their approach and their, um, their specialty to it kind of gives us a whole comprehensive understanding. Um, and that's really where we are here now. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so let's just give you a few examples of uh, the MVP success stories. Uh, uh, we had a patient who is uh, uh, male. Hey, hey, Lana. Hey, Lana. This is Dr. Kimball. You got you, you're fading in and out. It's really hard to understand you. So I don't know if you got to get closer or. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was my man. Okay, so we're gonna discuss uh, the example of the MVP success stories we encountered and uh, the first patient, this is a real life patient who is a, a male who lives alone in the community with prior medical history of hypertension, COPD, uh, ventricular thrombosis on eloquence, severe systolic heart failure, alcohol use disorder. When the patient first came to us, he had 11.99 insurance uh, at that time, for uh, you know, the first encounter I would say with him uh, for me was uh, at that time he had 25 inpatient admissions within the last 365 days related to cardiac symptoms and alcohol intoxication. And he had a pattern of leaving AMA. Um, uh, and uh, so the first time I met with him, it was sort of like peeling an onion. Every time, every encounter, every readmission brought new life to the complex problem that he had. Uh, the first time I met with him and we did an assessment, um, the driver of utilization was uh, uh, figured out as inadequately addressed substance use disorder. 
Uh, so uh, during the MVP assessment, patient reported that if he had a consistent person, he would be more likely to follow up with medical care. Uh, and uh, our response at that time, we addressed his readiness for change regarding alcohol dependence. Uh, we integrated change motivating factor consistent person into the response plan. He was uh, uh, connected to the uh, to our clinic uh, for the having the uh, primary care physician in the clinic, and he also uh, he developed a trust over time with our ED social worker uh, and with uh, with myself, and we described the consistency that you know the prescribed consistency was achieved. Uh, he engaged in a recommended care plan. As a result, he uh, basically he kept his PCP appointment for the first time after discharge in our clinic. And he actually also had a first chemical dependency evaluation. However, unfortunately, as it happens with the patient with such a, uh, with a prolonged alcohol use disorder, uh, he uh, basically re so fell on the wagon, so to speak, and he came back to us yet again um, with uh, basically the same story. He started drinking, he stopped taking medications, and he started having uh, cardiovascular symptoms, and uh, um, the, the vicious cycle came back. So when he came back to us next time, um, we also realized that he, he, you know, he didn't uh, have a, basically, he wasn't a, Wait at that time for a long time already. So he had experiencing some financial issues. He couldn't get to his appointments anymore because he didn't have money for to get to his appointments and he didn't have transportation. We couldn't get him into the uh, rehab uh, for his uh, for the to get physical therapy because he did not have uh, you know Medicaid uh, and. Only with his 1199 insurance, they learned that he would have to pay so many payments for each day of stay that it would be impossible. He would never accept that. So yet again, there was another discharge. But at that time, the plan was already okay. Let's help him to get Medicaid. Uh, next time when he came back again, he already had Medicaid in place. So we worked through, so every time as he was coming back, yes, he was coming back, but he was getting, we were able to get him access to more and more services that would help him to deal with his uh, uh, chronic conditions. Um, so uh, he got his Medicaid uh, and the discharge plan was, but he was physically very deconditioned. So at that time, uh, the decision was by the medical team or by the uh, physical therapist that she, he would need to be sent to the uh, subacute rehab, which uh, being that he already had Medicaid, that was possible. He was sent to subacute rehab and, uh, uh, you know, he stayed out after that. He, uh, he was discharged from subacute rehab and he stayed out already for maybe a month and a half which was a big uh, achievement because the lens uh, for him to stay in the community was extended more. So again, he came back once again, um, uh, again, the same issue, uh, he, you know, but he already, um, <clears throat> so that was another uh, re referral to the uh, uh, substance, uh, not substance, uh, subacute rehab. So he went back to the subacute rehab. Uh, he came back uh, uh, to the community. And uh, when he came out to the community, the conversation was, okay, let's make sure that you now have your Medicaid transportation so you can get to your uh, appointments. Uh, now, since he had Medicaid, he already had managed care plan on the Medicaid. So we were able to uh, connect him to the primary care physician in the community. That's more consistent because once you go to our clinics, uh, basically you don't have, usually it happens that you don't have the same primary care physician uh, 
every time you come in. But if you have a, a primary care physician in the community, it's a, then that's consistency that he was looking for. So we were able to get him uh, Medicaid transportation. We were able to get him to, um, to go to uh, accessoride, uh, uh, through go through accessoride application process. So we had that as well because he was planning to return to work. Um, so he can go use the accessoride for the transportation to go to work. And he uh, saw his, that he called, uh, basically he called us and stated that he went to see his PCP. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, so he's still, now he's still in the community. Uh, we are hoping that we don't see him uh, again <laughs> in the closest future, but we keep a tab on him uh, for uh, all the other needs that he has uh, while being in the community. So that's, uh, that's one of our success stories. I also just wanted to make note that he's call, called back constantly to Lana when, once he's been in and out like this, when he's in the community, he actually calls her quite constantly and keeps in touch. So it's really great the rapport that she's made with him. Okay, so now we have another success story. Um, this is a 73 year old uh, Punjabi Hindi speaking female. And she has a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, a systolic heart failure. Projection is only, uh, is actually, um, it's about 20%. Um, <clears throat> she has, she resides alone with very minimal support. Now, um, our facility actually does a lot of work around heart failure. We have its own dedicated unit, its own dedicated pharmacist, um, and has a, a heart failure MP who comes to the multidisciplinary rounds in the morning, and then also sees patients in the afternoon. Um, so for me, this case came to me by my, the heart failure pharmacist. She called me because she had concerns. Um, herself and the CHF um, nurse practitioner met with the patient at bedside and the nurse practitioner speaks the patient's language and they were able to you know, really suss out whether or not the patient was compliant with their meds. And it was found out that she was taking them. You know, She was able to get them from the pharmacy. They're delivered once a month, a very small copay that she does pay. Um, and as she's taking them, like, you know, she, she's taking her meds and she says she's following the fluid and diet restrictions. So the pharmacist called me because she said, I don't know what else is left to do. And I, I said to her, I think this is now worsening progression of disease. And maybe now we need to ask the team for a goals of care discussion or possibly let's explore advanced heart failure options at this point. Um, you know, so that was kind of the way the discussion went, not realizing that Lana had seen this patient. <laughs> I was already working on some supports in the community because as we said, she um, resides alone. Her family uh, lives about, I guess, like an hour or two away. They're not as involved as they should be. Um, she goes to her, her temple every day, does a little chores, odds and ends jobs just for, um, you know, a little bit of money. Um, but, you know, she's also trying to be very independent, like she doesn't want that independence taken away. Um, so we found, um, next slide please. So what we found was that she had inadequately addressed goals of care, inadequate supports and services in the community. And, we, you know, we realized that, you know, she does need to be linked with a lot of these supports. And Ms. Lana did a great job with actually managing to set up, um, what is it, a Medicaid? It's the assessment, the independent assessment interview through uh, Medicaid uh, to determine patients' eligibility for the Medicaid long-term home care services. Right. So it, it took a lot of coordination on her part, but she was actually able to get that done, which was great. Um, and as far as speaking to the team, uh, I believe they did tell to our cardiology consult team and, you know, suggested to them that she may need advanced heart failure options. Um, and the last time she was here, she was actually transferred to our sister hospital, Bellevue, um, for that. And they have been working her up now for these advanced heart failure options that could be available to her. But, you know, this case really highlighted that we you know, we don't start addressing the, this issue early enough with patients, you know, especially patients who have heart failure, you know, we know that their disease is gonna progress at some point. And 
you know, we still, you know, we need, there's still work to be done on how we can start incorporating a goals of care or a palliative care consult when these patients do come back. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some key takeaways with this whole case when we did our um, case review um, was that we had to make sure that, you know, um, we were using our interpreter services for patients who, you know, um, for providers who spoke the same language to make sure there wasn't like a cultural um, or language barrier there. Um, so we, you know, really wanted to make sure that we we're using our best, um, our best communication uh, possible with patients, especially to drill down to, you know, make sure, ensure compliance or understanding of their disease process. Um, I believe Jennifer, um, you're gonna take it away. Oh, you're muted. Thanks. We, um, over the course of doing this targeted intervention, we saw 123 unique MVPs that we tracked for the time that we were involved with this MAC series, and we continue to do so. What we found is that um, compared to the group of MVPs that were not seen by the MAC team, our cohort graduated as MVPs. They literally dropped off the definition of an MVP. And their, um, their re as evidenced by their um, readmission rate and their days of treatment was, was reduced compared to the, um, the population. So again, for us, getting data has been a challenge, but this is um, very promising, and that's why we are going to be able to continue forward with hardwiring some of the things and best practices we identified during the Time and Max series. And then I'll let Dr. Kimball um, end the presentation for us. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, um, for the next steps, I know I'll just be brief. I know we've run a little bit over time. Um, you know, we got to continue to re refine the, the care alerts themselves because we can be doing all this work and we have Lana as our champion in the ED and identifying these patients, but if providers don't get the, this information, um, it's, it's, it's never going to be sustainable. So trying to figure out a way to refine the physician involvement, get the clear visibility of the MVP alert into EPIC, integrate it well into our, into our EMR and have it pop up in a way that um, doesn't need extensive onboarding because even if we onboard everyone, there's always people coming into the ED who aren't familiar with the system. If it takes a lot to use, it's just gonna naturally fall off. So we really need to get it integrated into our workflow um, and um, figure out how that's possible with our EMR. Um, and you know, we just gotta have to continue to get data on this and try to figure out, um, because um, we know it's working, it seems it's working on our case-to-case uh, -case basis, but well, we ought to get some more robust data and try to figure out exactly um, what's working, what's not, and try to continue just to integrate it into our uh, everyday daily practice. Um, and so I think the next part would be questions. Do we have time for several questions? We do have some in the chat. Um, we're definitely over time, so if folks do want to jump, um, you can go ahead, but if you want to stay for the questions, um, you're definitely welcome to. <laughs> okay, one of the questions is, can you speak to what changed your approach in working with MVPs focusing on social determinants of health versus a diagnosis? Um, I think what really helped was the assessment of the MVPs. Um, because part of the assessment is asking the five whys. Um, it's really like, why did you come back? Like, why, why are you returning? Why? Like, you keep asking in like different ways that you're able to kind of drill down and you realize sometimes it's not their disease process, but they don't feel like they have the support at home. So they don't feel comfortable at home. I think we had um, um, one, the COPD patient. And she had anxiety more than anything. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we had the, she had the housing hardship mm -hmm. and she had a very uh, unstable housing situation. 
So uh, every time she couldn't really have a full uh, night of sleep because she had to share the room with the uh, granddaughter. So uh, basically lack of sleep uh, created for, uh, you know, caused her panic attack. And panic attacks are very similar in the presentation to uh, cardiac symptoms. Uh, being COPD. that she was, uh, you know, she had COPD, uh, you know, that basically it's very similar. And she ended up in our emergency room uh, and has been admitted quite a number of times uh, for COPD. But then, uh, you know, after our very, very close assessment and conversation with her and with the family uh, and consultation with the medical providers on the team, uh, the consensus was that she simply needs anti-anxiety medications to add to, to her regimen and uh, that would address her anxieties and her panic attacks and, you know, but um, that was done and, uh, you know, but until the housing situation is uh, corrected and changed, uh, this will still uh, show up. Uh, but, you know, at least we'll, we already will know what are the cause uh, for those uh, visits to the emergency room. Okay. We have um, several other questions. One I can combine into, because it's the same thought process, of all of the patients eligible, how did you select the two MVPs per day? And by selecting only two, what did you learn from them versus all that were presenting? I'd like to answer that. When we were planning our participation in Max, we wanted to be successful and we identified early on, unlike our first experience where we went over the, we, we went to impact the entire population of our patients per day, we couldn't do it. We didn't have the bandwidth. So we made a decision to look at those patients that were most complex, that would benefit from the MAX intervention, but more importantly would point out the gaps in our care delivery and give us the opportunity to really improve care. And we found that early on with our chemical dependency patients that we were able to really optimize the use of the ED leads program, which was underutilized and not well integrated into this work. And I think that's been something that we really hardwired where they easily became the quarterbacks for these patients. They found um, you know, chemical dependency programs. They used the PEER, which was a new program to the hospital. So we really used it to improve care delivery and benefit the patients over time. Okay. And the final question is, can you provide a few examples of who are the targeted partners that you identify as key? Is it the network within the residence circle, the patient circle or ex external or both? Um, I think it's both. I think it's definitely both. Uh, you know, we uh, very much, uh, very often we found that the key partners uh, were definitely uh, caregivers uh, who uh, live in the same household. Uh, quite often they were always the better historians, the better uh, information providers, uh, they would open our eyes on a lot of issues that patients would not otherwise uh, be telling us for many reasons. Uh, so, and it, of course, also uh, community providers, uh, hemodialysis centers, uh, very much like, you know, we, we would hear from the patient, oh, I cannot go to the hemodialysis because uh, I, I need help to navigate stairs in my lobby and there is no disability accessible uh, ramp. And then we would call the uh, hemodialysis center and say, hey guys, maybe you can do like a different mode of transportation for the patient. So there is, you know, they come through the ambulance and on the stretcher, then they don't need to negotiate the stairs. Uh, so, you know, this uh, back and forth, and they would tell us either, yes, we'll do it. We have those incidents. And we had incidents that will say, when they will say, you know, 
Uh, this is not really the truth. Patient keeps on refusing hemodialysis just mm -hmm. because patient is not adherent and finds, you know, different ways to, you know, and then we would speak with the family and they would say, yeah, we come every time to help. And the patient just says no. So uh, then uh, health home, very key, very important partners. Um, and uh, they're the ones who are making home visits. They see their home environment. Very often, that's something that we do not know, being that we are in the facility, we are facility-based. So they are our eyes and ears in the community. So if we, we often either find them that they're already linked to the patient, or if patient does not have it, we, we would find a way to make a referral and to make that connection. So there is a care coordinator in the community, and once it's done, we basically feel that we can breathe a little easier because patient will, will not fall through the cracks. It will be the, uh, the you know, people who are gonna be watching patient in the community, making the connection, uh, accompany patient to the uh, medical doctor's appointments and et cetera. So. I just wanted to add another piece of um, goodness that happened early on in our journey when we identified our patients needed accessoride. Um, you know, I contacted the accessoride um, service, and once they heard what our project was, the person gave me their fax number. People really want you to reach out to them to partner, and you would be so surprised that if you ask what you get. And, you know, in terms of our managed care department, people who heard what we were doing were like, can we partner with you? because this would make our life easy. This is something that we've been wanting to work on also. So it's been a real win-win by just reaching back out, and that's something that we really had stopped doing, just focusing on what's in front of us, but really trying to build and just to address um, root causes. I think that's something that's been very motivating. Well, thank you all so much um, for an amazing presentation and for the discussion afterwards as well. Um, and thank you all for hanging with us. I know we went a little over, but it was so um, important to hear all the work that they've been doing. Um, so we appreciate that. If you do have any other questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us um, and we can get those answers over to you. Um, and we hope to see you next Thursday, same time. Um, we'll be talking about uh, Smart Care in Massachusetts, which is a mobile integrated health program. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all there and enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Thank you all so much.